All right, welcome back into There Will Be Bourbon. I'm your host, Eric Bandazeski, and tonight I have the Joe Kent with us. Joe, how are you, sir? Good, man. How you doing? I am doing fantastic. So as you know, this show gets fueled by bourbon, and in, in, uh, in honor of Joe and his Oregon heritage, I will be sipping on the finest Black Maple Hill bourbon. Oh, yeah. It comes from uh, Joseph, Oregon. Familiar with that area? I am, man. It's great out there. Okay. High desert. Yeah. High desert? Okay, cool. Yeah. Good deal. So that's what I'll be having. Um, and then let's kind of just get right into that. So, Joe, you were born. Uh, well, let me give you your bio first, and then, then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about where you, where you hail. Uh, I'm going to do the Cliff Notes version, and then we can really touch into it. So, Joe's a retired Special Forces Warrant Officer with over 20 years of service, 11 combat deployments. Joe began his career in 1998 at 2nd Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment, and went to Special Forces Assessment and Selection in 2001. Uh, upon successful completion of the Special Forces Qualification Course, Joe spent 10 years at 5th Special Forces Group before attending selection for the U.S. Army Special Operations Command Capabilities Integration Group. That sounds like an amazing acronym. Uh, Joe retired from the Army in 2018. So, Joe, real quick, what, what, what area does 5th Group specialize in, for those that don't know? Middle East, man, the middle of the Middle East. So the middle of the Middle East. Most, most of the, the Arabic-speaking countries of okay. the Middle East. Um, a little bit of play over into Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the, uh, the upper stands, but primarily just, you know, where it's really, really hot and uh, a, lot of, a lot of GWAT terrorism going on. Yeah, so... Uh, what was it like growing up in Oregon? So, man, it's actually changed a good deal from, as I found out now that I moved back, changed a good deal uh, in the last 20 plus years. Um, when I was growing up in the 80s and the 90s, I think Portland was very much an up and coming, very small yeah. city. It's still kind of small, mm -hmm. um, but I just grew up kind of in the suburbs of Portland, um, just a couple miles from downtown. So I had a great childhood, man. It was super, what I think of as like very normal, running around, playing in the woods. Uh, the great thing about Oregon is you're always about an hour away from the mountains, the beach, whatever you want. So very similar to you guys down there in California. We're, we're spoiled with nature down here. So I kind of grew up in the city, yeah. but in the woods at the same time. So yeah, pretty, yeah, pretty awesome way to grow up. So did you have military in your family or what led you to, because I mean, 1998. So this is a different time, obviously, in the world. Uh, in 1998, you and I aren't that far apart age-wise for about six or seven months but 1998 was very different for me I was you know pretending I was going to be a professional baseball player one day and I was chasing that dream but you uh, was it always the plan to join the army or special forces like what made you choose that route man I really don't I, as long as I knew I had to pick something when I grew up I was going to join the military and do okay. something commando-ish um, and the more research as I got older, I was like, well, let's come up with a plan and what does that look like? Um, and so I read a bunch of books because that's, you know, there's no internet back then. Um, exactly. So I, I read, <laughs> read, you know, I read the Green Berets, of course, and I read uh, a book about all the different uh, special forces. It's called like the inside story of America's secret warriors. And it, it you know, highlighted the SEALs and the Rangers and the SF. I, I thought that the SF guys had like the most diverse mission, um, and especially for like the late nineties where like war wasn't really happening. I thought, yeah. well, hey, no matter, no matter what, if I go and I get the race, I'm going to kind of get to go still to see the war and not just train for it. So I kind of set my sights on that um, going into the military. So was there family involved or was this just something you always just grew up wanting to do? Like uh, family so history, we, parents, grandparents? Yeah, no? the, the typical, uh, both my grandfathers were in, in the Second okay. World War. Yeah. Uh, I, had, I had an uncle uh, who was in the Marine Corps during the, uh, the 80s. Um, but other than that, not a, not a big military town, obviously, Portland, yeah. and then uh, not a ton of military in the family. That's crazy, man. Um, because, yeah. it, well, and the main reason I say that that is crazy is because what I said before we started recording is a lot of people don't realize that the, the Pacific Northwest and the state of California, they put a lot of people into the military. Uh, where I think if you grow up on the East Coast like I did, especially in the South, you know, we have a very preconceived notion of the West Coast, especially California. Um, I think most of us grow up thinking California is nothing but L.A. I know I did before I actually experienced it. So, yeah. um, okay, so you, you get into the Army. You chose the Army. Were you able to secure yourself a signing bonus, man, or did you just go? <laughs> Do you no, I, mean, I, I went to recruiters. Like, they didn't come to me. Like, all branches. Yeah. 
I, I tell like from the time I was like 16, I was like, so can I join when I'm 16? And they're like, no, you have to finish. <laughs> like, That's a bummer, man. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I went and I don't think I got a signing bonus, but I got, thanks to my parents who were very, a little bit surprised I was going to join the military um, initially, but then by the time I went and pulled the trigger, they were like, yeah, he's going to do it. But my parents were like, hey, if you're going to do it, make sure you get what you want. Don't just go sign up yeah. for whatever they have available thinking it's yeah. going to work. Which, like, I don't know how the hell they knew that. And that, that's what I tell people. They're like, oh, you've been in the military for 20 years. Well, what advice do you have? And that's the exact advice I give. So I knew I couldn't, I couldn't go right to SF, um, but I had done enough research that there was the Ranger Regiment and I could get a Ranger contract. So okay. I was lucky enough to get a Ranger contract right away. So you went and did that. That was your first thing after basic training. Uh, obviously hosted at, at, at Fort Benning. So you went right into Ranger. You went into the RIP and did that? Yeah, man. Yeah, that was quite the quite the experience it was it was yeah. a great time it was actually like um pretty much everything you you think it's going to be joining the army is is the ranger regiment so yeah. i had a great experience there did you did you well let's maybe back up did you did you play sports at all or no, no, well, I, no? I played uh i played football i wrestled okay. um i was really into boy scouts i actually have uh, some boy scout leaders that were uh, pretty influential um who were prior military themselves um, so that, I think that, that kind of helped. Kinda, that kind of definitely helped out. Yeah. So, okay. So you finished Ranger school, uh, at this point, I assume you're old enough now to go ahead to select or the, the special operations or the, I can't speak the special forces qualification course, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, been in battalion for three in Ranger battalion for three years. So it's okay. like 2001 at this point. Um, and at the time Ranger regiment was an awesome place to be. Cause I don't think a lot of the army had a lot of money for training. Um, so we got to train a whole bunch, but that was kind of all that was on the, on the calendar. And I was like, man, yeah. that's, if I'm, if I'm an A4 and SF says that I meet the, meet the prerequisites, let's go, let's go for it. Um, so it's a special forces selection in September of, uh, 2001. All right. So this is where it gets interesting now. So September of 2001, for those listening at home, I hope you know what happened, uh, <laughs> around September 11th on or about, right? Yes. All right, so you're there in selection, 9-11 happens. How did you guys find out? Did they tell you right away, or were you guys out doing whatever it is you crazy guys do? I think they must have. Well, I think it was later on in the day, uh, as I remember. Like, we were, we had just taken the PT test that you take it for a brag, and they ship you off to Camp McCall. I, I think it still generally follows that same rhythm. So we had just been there for a couple of days. We really hadn't done anything hard yet. Um, I think we maybe had done a time to run or a time to rock or something like that. Um, and they called us into the conference room and, uh, you know, the commander gets up there and he's like, Hey, I got something very, very serious to tell you guys. And, and he goes on with this big America has been attacked thing. And at the time I'm an E4. So clearly I know everything. Yeah. And I'm thinking in the back of my head, I'm like, I can't believe that there's a scenario for like SFAS. Cause you know, you've been to the places where they give you like a, a fake scenario for training. So it, it didn't sit in with me at all at first. That's all I was thinking. I was yeah. Like, I got like bad G2 from all my buddies said there was yes. like, we're just going to, you know, rock until the beat fell off. Um, so it, it took another, I think probably a couple hours later, they started, uh, they had a bunch of instructors come out and put us in formation. And they were like, Hey, if you're from New York or if you're from DC or if you have family in those places, you need to come with us right now. So you can start calling your loved ones. And that's when I was like, oh, this is pretty wild, man. I, I, this must be real. We're actually under attack of some sort. Yeah, um, it wasn't until as the uh oh, we may have lost Joe temporarily. All right, let's see if we can get Joe. Joe, you out there? Yeah, I got you, man. I don't know where I cut off the hiccups. Yeah, no, no worries. I, I, okay, so. You you cut off right at where you said that this must have been serious. Yeah, it must have been serious. Um, and they, they gave us a really brief on what had happened. Okay. But as the month went on, they brought out newspapers and uh, magazines. They'd let us read. Uh, after, after we were done, you get to your final point, and if you had gotten to the right point and you weren't, like, getting cut, the instructors <laughs> would be like, hey, you guys, you, you guys need to read this, was the way they would say it. It wasn't yeah. like we want to, like, read this. And so we'd sit there and you, you know, you just pumped all day, but then you read it. And so we were, we were kind of process. We were like in a little, uh, in a little bubble trying to process everything that happened. So, man, how, how did your instructors, did they, did, did you, could, could you sense anything was up with them or were they all business type of thing or just ready no, to get out of where they were at? 
that was the biggest thing. You could tell yeah. when they were when it was game on. They were briefing you on the event. They did the whole stoic thing, which is selections famous for. Yeah. Um, but they would somewhat break rule when they're handing out the magazines, and especially as it, it got closer um, to us being done. A bunch of them would say, like, you guys don't understand, like, the whole country's changing. Um, and then when we found out who was selected and, and who wasn't, I was lucky enough to get selected. And a bunch of the old timers came out and they're like, I don't know if you guys realize this, but you're going to have to knock out the Q course, but you're definitely going to war. You know, and, and at the time I was like, man, I, we're going to go to war for like several years, which sounds crazy to say right now, but I, yeah. I didn't think, that, I thought it was like Panama or Mogadishu or yeah. know, something, something short, but no. So you weren't planning on doing 11 deployments? <laughs> no, man. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if anybody in the army is that. That's nuts, yeah. Uh, when I read that, I was like, damn, a fucking 11? And then there's the, the Star Major guy that just got the Medal of Honor this week. 17? Like, yeah. that's... Okay, so now you're done. You've, you've been selected. Uh, you finished selection. What, everything you were done in 2003, was it prior to the start of the yes, Iraq yeah. War? Or was it already been going on? Yeah, so did the Q course that takes, you know, about a year and some change to go through. I, I got a six month language that didn't help okay. going to fifth year. Every, everybody yeah. kind of scored a six month language going to fifth. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, by the time I got out of uh, the Q course, we had already invaded Iraq. And so I thought, man, I missed Afghanistan I missed yeah. and I missed Iraq. Like, this is going to suck doing the rest of my career as like a slick sleeve. And, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> again, again, my, my, my 1990s mentality, I was like, wow, right. That's yeah. Uh, but no, you didn't. So when was the first, what was your first deployment? It was pretty much immediately after getting a fifth group. So I got the fifth group in the summer of 2003. Um, and okay. by September, we were on a bird uh, back to Iraq. Fifth group, for whatever reason, man, they're, they're, they had a really good perspective on what was going on. And, and some people were saying, hey, we're going to get out of Iraq because we took out Saddam and it's all over. When I, I, remember got, I was there, I was wondering, oh, we're going home. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I got the group, they had pulled half the group out early to start training for counterinsurgency and, and, and a whole new mission set that we adopted. So when I got there, they were like, this is this is far from over for us. Maybe the big yeah. army's going to leave, but yeah. we're not going anywhere. That's the plan. And so we uh, we hit the ground running. So I, I was over there by uh, September of 03. September of 03. Okay. Yeah. Um, at this point, so where were you at in your career at this point? Were you E5, E6? Where, where Okay. I was, I was E5. I actually got promoted to E6. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you do your first deployment. Uh, you come back. At that point, were you guys kind of like, okay, you know, first deployment, did it, did it meet what you had kind of always thought it would be growing up and doing this stuff? Or were you wanting to do more yeah. or over it pretty quickly or what? I mean, I, I, I definitely, I got to do on my first deployment, I got to do more than I ever thought I was going to get to do. I mean, had I, had I been, had I did like, you know, one or two missions that yeah. probably would have been like, again, in my 90s soldier mind, it would have been like, well, okay, at least I did it once or twice. But um, I was lucky. I went to a team that was very direct action oriented. Um, I actually, I posted about this a couple of days ago. We replaced ODA 585 and 595. 95 is the, uh, the team that the men on uh, horseback book and then 12 strong is about oh, sure. two of the yes. guys bill bennett and kevin moorhead had gotten killed um going after the u.n bombers um u.n bombers that was uh zarkawi aqi the forerunner yeah. advice that was their remember. uh kind of debut on the world stage yeah um, he, people knew of him before from the lead up to iraq yeah um, but that was kind of his like here i am and i'm gonna be a problem so we we replaced those guys literally we, we replaced them as they were like washing blood out of the trucks uh, a bunch of guys had gotten wounded on that hit and they were like hey it's a, it's it's all yours good luck and so we proceeded to knock out some targets uh going after the deck of cards and aqi guys and then about halfway through that mission we got retasked for a more traditional special force mission there was a bunch of um saddam or anti-saddam militias that we had to demobilize and then form into a cohesive fighting unit and we got a whopping two weeks to do it uh for political correct because of political pressure um, so that, that put us in the middle of the city, working with Iraqis, generating our own intelligence, doing our own reconnaissance work, and then knocking out our own targets. Um, so when I came off my first deployment, man, I was like, I cannot believe I have to do any of that. And I want to do more. Oh, really? Okay. So you never got to that point where you're like, man, this sucks. You loved what you were doing. No, I mean, I had good perspective. I think maybe from being, um, just in Ranger Battalion before SF's okay. like, 
way more um, big boy rules. So, I mean, we were living in pretty awesome team houses. Yeah. We had doing great missions. And then we got thrown into the deep end where we were making up our own team houses in the middle of Baghdad and running around with indigenous guys. And so to me, it was just like, man, I'm going to do this for as long. I'm going to do this for as long okay. as this is this. Yeah. So how was how was everything with everybody else on your team though? Did did the guys come back the same way, or were you one of the ones that was just you you, you responded a lot differently, or was everyone kind of the same mindset of how you took it and came back with? Uh, I think most guys were in the same same mindset. I mean, it was pretty early in the war still, and yeah. so most guys were pretty fired up. There's some of the older guys that had done the initial one. They they were because fifth group was kind of spread out throughout the world when 9/11 happened, but. Um, like some of my team leadership, they were in Kosovo when 9-11 happened at the end of a, uh, I think a six month trip. Um, and then after that, they went and invaded um, Afghanistan and then they got pulled in. And some of them even got pulled out to go like sitting in Kuwait and Jordan in the lead up to the Iraq war. So we did have some guys who were like, hey man, <laughs> this, you may be excited now, but give it a couple of years. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. When's yeah. the next one? Well, when you're yeah. what, 20? 20- Three twenty-four. You don't. Yeah, really I, was, I, was, I was twenty-three. And didn't have to twenty-three. Yeah, that's that's it's man. So that's why I think like my biggest question for you is looking back on that now, and if you don't want to touch on it, I, I I totally get it. But how do you feel based on everything that you and your teams done or did to know that you would go on to do ten more of those deployments, and that here it is, two thousand twenty. You know we're. You know, I, I get it. Every it seems like every year we're having talks to get us out by X year or whatever. Um, right. Do you feel like everything you did was it worth it? I guess would be a good question. Yeah. Based on the, I mean, the amount of time we've been there. Right. I mean, I think the only logical answer, like for, for I, I think to stay sane, guys like us who went and, and fought in these places, we have to separate it. Uh, two for me, it's two ways. Like personally was it worth it like it's pretty much my entire life so to, for me to say no it wasn't worth it that kind of like throws out my entire yeah. life um and I, I learned who i was i learned everything over there um so for me personally yes however if you if you are to look at it objectively was it worth it for our nation was it worth it in terms of what we gained that's where it gets it's just it's just hard to justify um regardless of how well versed you are in foreign policy and that stuff yeah. it's hard to say what we did in Iraq really mattered what we did in Afghanistan really to, to me. And I, and I mean, right. it's a long conversation, but yeah, it's, um, I had a, I mean, I had a great career, served with great people. Yeah. Um, and I have like, I don't harbor any ill will against the army or the DOD. I, I do wish our politicians took a more longer view and really looked at the real game. Yeah. And that's the issue. I think where people don't, people, in, people don't have time for nuance anymore. Right. right. You know what I mean? Everybody wants the headline of something that's slightly a little more intricate than just U.S. Army has been in Afghanistan for 19 years. Okay, why? Right. And then no one ever wants to learn all that. Um, Let's get back. Let me get back onto your your career. So uh, I'm looking at you, man. You look great. Obviously, did you did you ever sustain any injuries or what was the the worst thing that you know? you know 11 deployments you kind of expect the worst at some point right everyone's luck runs out but you look pretty good man yeah man i was extremely lucky i mean i have all the wear and tear crap from a career yeah. you know running around a body armor on and throwing myself out of airplanes um but i mean you know i had some blast stuff here and there um where i ate some charges <laughs> um <laughs> charged ate some some ieds and whatnot um hearing is probably the biggest one but i mean you know, overall, compared to those who didn't come back or those who yeah. came back, like, came, like I, I feel incredibly lucky, you know? That's, that's fucking amazing. That's because, um, I mean, I just remember going to, and I don't know if we talked about it in the chat or not. I may have talked about it with Braxton, but when I was in drill sergeant school, I was with just the way it worked out. I was with four guys who were all Rangers together at one point. And I remember one of them, he said he had, he had like seven deployments. The other one had six at that point. And I was just like, I was still at that stage where it's like when you, cause you didn't meet a lot of those guys in conventional right. army where I come from. So when you meet them, you know, you get to know them, you get to talking to them and it's like, well, why would you, why would you leave that? You seem like you love doing that. And I just remember one of the guys saying like, look, man, eventually your number's coming. And he just, 
you know, A had lost, I think, two buddies or one of them got hit, one he lost on his last, you know, deployment over to Afghanistan. And he just, it was just that time to get out, right? So, I mean, I respect that and respect the fact that you went and did it for so long. Like, I don't think people grasp what 11 combat deployments is like. And not, it's not, like I said, look, man, I'm not a fucking war hero. I, I enjoy when I go on the deployments that I did. And uh, it sounds like you enjoyed yours as well. But if my 11, if I went and got deployed 11 times, it wouldn't be like what you did. And that's why I think people can't really understand what men and women like yourself have done. And I think, I think it, people need to know a little bit more than what we do at this point. It's the same reason why I push so hard to share Braxton's story. It's, your story is amazing, yeah. man. And guys need to, people, just Americans need to know what men like yourself have sacrificed for this country. Yeah. Well, I mean, I appreciate it, man. I, to me, you know, obviously losing my wife was a huge sacrifice, uh, right. but we were both doing what we loved. And, and to me, it was never like a huge sacrifice. I mean, there was a couple of times where I'm like, I, I don't really know if I'm feeling this to the point of, but by the time I got over there, you know, it's like, all right, this is what, this is what I do. This is my life, you know? And I don't, I don't mean that in like a depressed way. I mean that in like, well, yeah. when I, whenever I would yeah, step back, I'd be like, man, this is awesome. Like I get, I get paid for this. There's somebody's in a cubicle right now, like hating their life and they're in like, they're in like student debt or some crap like that. And like, I'm making tax free money right now with like all my best friends to play commando. So, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm probably, I'm probably oversimplifying it, but. <laughs> well, I mean, like in the short term, you wouldn't it, it, like, yeah, it'd be like, wow, okay, maybe I'll get to do that. But once you start doing it, you're right. You can look back and be like, well, at least I'm not doing like what that dude's over there hating life. Yeah. And all, but um, now I do want to, I, I do want to go into the story about your wife, but kind of going back on without moving on yet, we're talking about what's been going on for 20 years. And now yeah. what's your take on what you see though in our country, Never mind what's going on in the middle East. Like what, what do you feel, like, especially where you're from, man? Like a lot of these things going on in, in Portland uh, and some of these nations or some of these cities around the country, like, did you ever think with all the stuff you and your guys did that you would be here seeing this stuff take place because like what we're really seeing is some of the shit that took place after fucking saddam fell you know what i mean like that it's yeah. very similar like people don't want to say that because like oh it's the united states that would never happen right. but it's right. happening yeah I, I i used to tell people um why i thought to me baghdad was eerie um and why baghdad was eerie people be like oh it's because it's a foreign culture and all that i'm like no man baghdad's actually a very well established yeah. modern city especially in 2003 before it endured so much war and they had actually yeah. a good deal of war. I was like, Baghdad's eerie because it's a modern city. There's, there's some people that do the traditional dress, like, you yeah. know, like foreign culture, but there's like, I'd say 75% of the folks dress like normal people there. Yep. Um, and I know, and this is from my perspective as a, as a 23 year old kid, when I went over, I said, right. this place is super normal. I was expecting some crazy scene. Um, like I'd see later on in some more remote places. Um, but the reason why Baghdad was so eerie is because the bottom dropped out so fast. Um, in 03, you saw an actual functioning society. A key leader got taken out. Some people got disenfranchised. We made bad moves, what we did with the Sunnis and, and, and the CPA and all that. And rapidly it descended and descended so hard that by 2006, when I was back there, the city was almost unrecognizable. They were setting up checkpoints street by street. I mean, they were killing each other based on their last names. Yep. Um, and so to me, I was like, man, this is, this is a actually really scary place because it shows how thin um, the lid that holds yeah. society together really is. I mean, it doesn't take much to jar that lid loose and just have everything spill out. Um, so seeing it here in, in, in our country, obviously it's different circumstances, but like you said, there's a lot of echoes of, of what we saw in Iraq and other places over there. I mean, just five months ago, I wouldn't have thought this was going to happen at all. I mean, I'd have been like, yeah, there's some... There's some kooky liberal people in Portland that if you gave them a chance, they'd, they'd go burn some stuff because they, you know, are kind of anarchists or whatever. Right. Um, I, but I did not expect it to get to this level uh, like it is right now. And so I think, I mean, that's why, and I, I've said this forever, that's why I think a show like, did, did you ever watch or hear The Walking Dead? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's why I always said, this is why this show is so popular is because what you said society we have this great massive super intricate technologically advanced society but at the end of the day 
as soon as that button gets flipped or pushed, it's going to fall yeah. apart pretty quickly. You know what yep. I mean? And we saw some of that once this pandemic started. Like, yeah. look at the run that was on just like basic supplies. Yeah. Toilet right. paper and meat, everybody just hoarding everything that they possibly could in the short term. Because you don't know what's going to happen. But, you know, like you said, this stuff is very, very fragile. And we take it so for granted here. And we've seen little pockets of this stuff, obviously, pop up. Um, my only thing is, and, you know, especially listening to guys like yourself talk about it. But when I talk to Ron or listen to him, uh, Ronald Moeller, for those of you guys that don't know, he was also on the podcast, a retired CIA uh, paramilitary operations officer, a guy who's been there and done that and seen every possible fucking thing you can. Like, at, talking to men like yourselves, like, if you guys thought it wasn't real, then maybe, you know, we could be like, oh, it's not that big a deal. It's just a bunch of fucking idiots running around in the night throwing shit. Yeah. But I think it is, it's a little bit more serious than that. Now, we also may have talked about this previously, but yeah, maybe they're not going to take and hold power. They don't have to. Right. They, they just got to be disruptors, right? Like, exactly. And that's why yeah. I said, like, going into this election, people are just assuming everything's going to go off without a hitch. And what's you, you think people really aren't having these conversations? Like, where and when do we show up? What time? How do we do it? Because everyone's going to try. Maybe not everyone, but most states, I would assume, are going to still try and do their in-person voting because that's how we do it, right? That's what we're trying to do. Yeah. If I'm playing that devil's advocate or I'm, I'm trying to be, hey, what are they thinking? Of course I would fucking destroy that or try or disrupt it or intimidate, yeah. you know, because then you set off a whole bunch of second and third order effects of when you yeah. prevent people from voting. Yeah. And, and the climate is such right now that everyone's just still kind of at each other's throat. And then one side has already said that they're comfortable with a certain amount of, of, of violence, you know, and some of this there's definitely um scorn to be casts on both sides however the escalation of violence to me has all been on one side um the right anytime there's been any kind of violence from the right's been widely condemned and it just hasn't gained any kind of real traction um what i saw in portland what really scared me it wasn't really the the antifa guys or the blm guys out mm. throwing molotov cocktails i mean that's all like obvious like okay we can go arrest those guys. It's not that big of a deal. Right. What was really concerning to me was so many otherwise intelligent, otherwise rational people have been driven for whatever reason to this, to support this type of behavior. And it didn't happen overnight. They got gradually sensitized to it. They amped the agitators in these protests. If we're still calling, we're still calling them protests, amped up the violence progressively all the way up until two, two weeks ago, a guy got assassinated and murdered on the streets of Portland and the first thing the media and other folks say is, well, you know, he was a far right guy and I think he had a Trump hat on and, you know, and then when they go through the, the actual, you know, the footage yeah. and the facts, the guy had a thin blue line hat on, he had a Patriot prayer or some like, Right, he group. is there as a prayer group. Yeah. Hat on. And even that, even that, like, okay, this is still America, right? What if yep. he had the most offensive t-shirt on ever? Like, we're, gonna ex we're, we're cool with him getting executed? And there's a lot of people that won't come right out and say that, but they're like, okay, yeah. And so... Like you said, what, what does it take? What's going to be the tipping point of the election? I mean, you show up at a polling station, you can create chaos, and then you even have on one side the Democrats have even said in their own war games ran by their leaders, hey, maybe we just won't accept the, uh, the actual yeah. outcome. You know, what if it's all, we'll just say it's an illusion, and then we'll have states threatening to succeed. And I'm like, are you fucking serious, man? And that's not, that's not like some fringe kid in his basement no. saying, that's, John Lester yeah. and like, what we're supposed to believe are serious people. So we must take them seriously. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, to see it unravel like this, this fast, I mean, to me and, and guys like you and I, like, it's like this, this seems just like Iraq. Yeah. And, and then that's why I'm, I'm, I'm almost afraid to think of what Iraq would have been like in 2003, if it was 2020 with social media. Now, because I remember very vividly when, when yeah. we finally captured Baghdad and it fell and, uh, the citizens realize Saddam's out of power. He's probably not coming back wherever he's at in the fucking country at this moment. Right. Like the change overnight was crazy. Like the sea, I just remember we were in a market in downtown and there was nothing. Um, pretty much all types of shipments of, you know, produce, food, all that stuff had stopped. But I remember the first thing that showed up was something these people never had was fucking satellite dishes. 
and phones. Yes. And cell phones, like all that showed up. It seemed like literally within a week. And then that just changed everything because now you have communication, but more so with that, we've already seen the issues that communication and basic cell phone technology has provided or caused us in Afghanistan a place. It happened in Iraq too shortly after that, but it was already kind of going on in Afghanistan. But imagine social media, imagine Twitter and fucking Facebook and all this shit available then to the insurgency. How much more deadly, in my opinion, I think we would have yeah. found ourselves. And I don't know how it would have played out. I don't know if it would have played out much differently, but I think it would have been think, a lot worse. Yeah, I think we've gotten like more intense a lot faster. I mean, I think the ability to communicate is something that we take for granted nowadays. Yeah. But like you said, like they didn't have satellite dishes. I remember them getting cell phones. Um, mm -hmm you know, for the first time. And that was a really, really big deal. And everybody wanted one and everybody had one. And I thought it was crazy in my 23 year old American mind. I'm like, why didn't someone let you guys have these? And all the Iraqis are like, because he didn't want us fucking talking, dummy. I'm like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. I guess that does make sense. It's kind of hard to cook up a conspiracy, yeah. you know, just word of mouth. I mean, you can do it, but it's just not right. gonna spread. It's hard to control. Well, I, I always remember as well as like uh, first deployment into Iraq, it was 2003. They had the, the quad band phones, if you remember those. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we had like two guys in our platoon that had them Yep. and they would charge people, you know, to use them. Right. But, <laughs> but we still largely for the first probably seven or eight months through Christmas was, it was all letters still like handwritten letters to home. Internet cafes were like three, four hour line waits on base. No one wanted to do that. Cause you're, you got a fucking line outside of a trailer with internet in it and you got indirect fire coming in all the time. Probably not the greatest place to just hang yeah. out and wait. Right. Yeah. Um, so I still, and then now, like I, when I did my last deployment was 2015 and we've all, we're all still walking around with iPhones and shit, like nothing changed. Right. right. That's such a weird thing to see in a very short amount of time. That was 12 years. We went from writing letters to, Oh, you I'm, I'm, yeah. yeah, you're right. You're FaceTiming from fucking Jordan. And it's like, Oh yeah, this, this place sucks. And it's like, yeah, America suck. <laughs> it's, it's, weird. it's very weird to see that. And, um, that's why I'm almost kind of. Because I feel like all these things, as you described, are fragile. The social media is fragile. The internet connectivity, all that's fragile. That goes away very quickly. You flip that switch, you know, towers don't work or the internet doesn't work. Power goes out. This is what, I, this is what cracks me up about Tesla drivers out here in California. We got rolling blackouts every fucking month, it seems like. You, like what are you going to do when you can't charge your car? We're, and then yeah. what do they, what do you do when the internet goes out and you can't charge your phone or you can't talk to your, you, you can't text. It, yeah. It's weird, man. I think we're really creeping towards a dangerous time that we weren't, I don't think anyone's really prepared for. No, I mean, I, something I, I realized I was living in the city and then moved out and all this kind of happened. And a big realization for me was living in a city takes a lot of trust in your, in your fellow neighbors. Mm -hmm. And you have to have a real big social contract, you know, contract. Yeah. It's like those Tesla drivers. I mean, yeah. very, very trustful people. I mean, they, they really are all in on the social contract, like even their yep. car uh, runoff power, all of us that are relying on electricity, which is pretty much all of us at this point. Um, we, we adhere to that, that social contract, um, which what, another reason why it's just crazy to me that there's so many folks that are at least providing ideological support for these actors that say like, no, we need to tear the entire thing down and we need to burn everything that's a symbol of it. And we need to go after anybody who believes in the, in the system and the system is whatever we decide it as we basically have control. Um, so I, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't feel like you have to have seen war to understand yeah, no. where this is heading. I think you just have to be able to do what you said. Like what, what is the left doing at the moment? They're war gaming, right? So everyone yeah. hears the term war and thinks the negative, but no, all that means is, Hey, we're running through scenarios. So businesses yep. do this every day. It doesn't matter what your job is. Every company you could possibly work for is figuring out, or playing different scenarios on what's going to happen to their bottom line. It's the same thing. Um, and I, I'm just, look, I'm not going to pretend I'm like a super prepper guy. I'm not, I'm probably way behind what we should be at this point. And that's just being honest, but most of the country is not going to be prepared. No, the overwhelming, like there's probably as few of the port, you know, what do they always say? Like, oh, 0.45% serve in the military in the United States. Yeah. I think even significantly less are actually ready for the lights to go out. You know what I yeah. mean? Because <laughs> it's kind of a bottomless hole, man. I mean, that's kind of what I liked about, the, you know, plug one of our friends' books. That's what I liked about Clay's book. 
is that like he didn't say there's any magic recipe that you don't need to have like X amount of rounds or X amount of gallons yeah. of gas. He was real honest about it. He was like, you have to have a social network. You have to be relying on people. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's what you need to survive. And that's what we all need to survive, which if everybody would stop and realize that, you know, I sound like a crazy hippie, like maybe we stop burning our cities down. You no, know, bro. But, we got to, we got to have our face in our phone, man. And this is, this yeah. is, yeah. <laughs> And it's true, like, because you write, you're saying you're talking about Clay's book, The Fucking Concrete Jungle. I'm going to try and talk yep. to him next week. But exactly, the first, the biggest focus he's talking about is, hey, man, just, just have a network of people you can talk to and trust. And you'd be surprised at the capabilities of each other. Right. Look at our fucking chat, man. The, the 12 yeah. of those, dude, it just blows my mind at what people can do. But you put together a, a competent group, you'd be surprised yeah. at each, everyone's capabilities or what they specialize in. I start thinking about, you know, the friends I was just hanging out with this week, one's a, you know, civil engineer, another one's a, a, a nurse, like all these things and skills that people have that people take for granted on because you're only, I think people think so short term at this point, we're just worried yeah. about tomorrow or what yeah. we're doing this weekend. Like no one takes the time to realize uh, there's a little bit more to life than what you post or right. what you look like. Yeah. Um, and we're all guilty of it, man, myself included. I'm not going to pretend I'm not. It's just, I ha I think I suffer from it. And Braxton's book helped me so much, man. Braxton's book is like brutal honesty about self-reflection and shit. And right. it, what really, and I even told him, like, what's, what bothered me about reading his book is it's like, it's so obvious that I can recognize what I need to work on and what my flaws are, but not even pride against with others it's internal pride like you're afraid to conquer your fucking your issues your demons yeah and i thought that was the coolest thing about his book is he's like that dude laid it all out there man that's that takes some fucking he really did i mean i i, I just finished it today man and like oh, I, did couldn't you? Okay. Find, I couldn't find the right words to describe it like he he strips away any kind of sugar coating yeah uh, what he was feeling um, when he came back from war and, and mm. moving on life from there. And um, he does it in such a way that it's still extremely eloquent, but he, he doesn't mess around with any of the, with any of the words. He just goes right yeah. forward. And that makes it so hard hitting. And so like, I was, it was, bold. I think someone else said this, he said it before I could, it was like hard to put down, but also hard to pick up. So the couple of times mm. I, really, I put it down, I was like, man, I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm in yeah. the right frame of mind to get back in there. I know That's I need right. to, when I was reading it, I was like, man, this is, this is incredible, man. Like, I mean, it definitely makes you like reflect, look at what's important and then also just be honest with yourself. Like he was. Yeah. I think Sean said that in the, I yeah, it might've been Sean. Um, all right, man. So let's now, now let, let's transition to what I feel like is, um, I just, I just, I still remember reading about this and, and obviously not knowing who you were at the time and then sitting here talking to you is just like one of those things that just, I don't really have explanation of how it happens or why it happens, but here we are. Um, your wife, uh, senior chief petty officer, Shannon Kent, uh, was killed in 16 January of last year while conducting combat operations in Syria. She was assigned to the special operations task force at the time of her death. Um, it, it doesn't take a lot of, of, of searching <laughs> to realize just how important she was to so many people, not just in the, in your community, but just what she kind of set forth to come after her for women in special operations, just the military in general. Like, you know, the stuff that gets people all upset about because they're women, they don't realize that your wife, that's who we're talking about. When we talk about the ones that are cut out to do that type of shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so when did, when did you, how did you meet your wife? So the, the first time we actually met was in 2007 in Baghdad. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 I went to a, <laughs> I went to a targeting meeting that she was basically running uh, about going after some, some bad guys somewhere. And so we spoke probably for five or 10 minutes and then that was it. Um, and I didn't see her again um, until 2013. We were both in, in some training together. <laughs> recognized each other and kind of hit it hit it off Damn, you know? six years man that's yeah that's did time. she remember you she did yeah, yeah okay yeah. that's good <laughs> but yeah yeah okay so uh so so how how did that work with with you guys like your careers obviously you were both still doing 
you know, your, your op tempo was ridiculous. And then somehow in between all that, you guys managed to have two sons. Like that's yeah. fucking like, I don't know how I can get how you found the time and can still do what you're doing, but how was your wife able to pull that off and still maintain her like involvement? I, in her- I, I mean, I, I, the honest answer is I, I don't know. She, she had an ability to prioritize and execute tasks that mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know where, where she got it from. Um, I mean, she, by the time we met, I mean, she had been to combat four times. Wow. Um, okay. I had been eight, um, I was kind of getting towards the end of, well, I wasn't really the end of my career, but I was, I was, I was getting up there, um, yeah. you know, and, and she was at the mid career mark and she knew she wanted to make a career out of the shops and she wanted to have a family. And so we, uh, we skipped kind of a lot of the formalities of, of dating and we were both like yeah. pretty damn busy. So we, uh, we kind of just went all in, man. And, and, and made it go of it. Like we had hit it off right away. Kind of like we're in the same spots of life. I kind of had this weird notion that I was going to like just deploy forever not any kids. And then one day Shannon was like, don't you think that's pretty fucking stupid? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I was like, well, you're not supposed to ask me about that. Like, yeah, I, okay, I get it. now that you make me think about it, this kind of stupid. That's um, funny. <laughs> kind of, I mean, sort of like Braxton's writing we were just talking about. Like, yeah. Shannon, that's forces dumb. you to. Dumb dumb thing I've ever in my life. Like, we should have a family. I'm like, yeah, you're right. We should. <laughs> so, so, okay. So now you got two little warrior babies. How old are they? Uh, five and three. Five and three. Okay. So I'm sure you've thought about this at this point. Do you, you realize that like the, the bloodline that they've got from the, you and their oh, yeah. mom, like, <laughs> oh, we, talk, we talk about that all the time. Man. Like, we're like, <laughs> yeah. like, I'm just curious, like what, you know, Hey, I hate to say it, but we may still be in Iraq and Afghanistan in like another 15 years when they, can Oh, start. I know. I, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I tell, I, I, I jokingly tell my son, so he's going to hear this growing up. Like, he'll ask me, like, where's that picture from? I'm like, oh, it's Iraq, buddy. You'll get together. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, man. That's Afghanistan. You'll see that one, too. So uh, do they, do they, uh, are they, do, are they aware of, like, what you've done and, and army uh, wise? Or, I mean, I get it. Three and five is young, but. Yeah, I mean, we talk about the military a lot. And so, like, okay. they ask me, army, was I in the army? Was mom in the Navy? Stuff like that, you know. They're into trucks and guns, so you have a gun to start. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, going down the same path I went down. That's how that's that's how I got interested in the army. Yeah, um, so yeah, but you wouldn't let them join the Marines, would you? Ah, you know, man, I, I, <laughs> the Marines do have pretty sweet uniforms. Oh, ours are coming back though. We got pinks and greens. They are. They're already out to the yeah. field, man. Yeah, we were supposed to have ours back in February, but the whole COVID thing shut down the logistics or whatever. But yeah. um. So what do you do now with, uh, like, I was reading through the, the Global War on Terrorism Memorial Fund. Is it, is it in your wife's honor? Or is it, like, more of something that kind of it's, yeah. I guess so, it's working on that? or? So the, the GY Foundation, it's for all of us. So it's, it's okay. the guys and, guys and girls who got killed, but then also yeah. the veterans. So just like on the National Mall, there's a Vietnam Memorial Awards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that whole, our purpose of the GY Foundation is to, putting up pressure on Congress and the Senate that they pass a bill that allocates funds to build the G1 Memorial Foundation somewhere on the national mall. And uh, how do you think, well, well, I mean, what, we've been doing this since 2001. Where are we at on that? Do you have any Man, positive I, things to share with the group at this point? <laughs> any positive developments? We have, uh, we have good bipartisan support for it. Uh-huh. Um, the problem yeah. is just, getting, I mean, right when we were making some major traction, COVID hit. And then now all the unrest and it's election year. So, I mean, honestly, our biggest issue is, is just getting people's attention. Um, so that's, that's the hardest, the biggest challenge we've had recently with the, uh, the foundation. Was that something your wife was passionate about? Or is this just something you've found yourself, you've kind of transitioned to post army? And uh, Yeah, once I, uh, I actually, after, after Shane was killed, uh, a friend of mine was the, the president of the foundation. So he was mm-hmm. one of the children of the uh, seventh group guy, Michael Rodriguez. Um, he hit me up and said, "Hey, do you want to be an ambassador?" And I was like, "What does that? What does that entail?" So sounds cool, right? Yeah, I was like, "What, what, what does that mean?" So I mean, we, we've gone and done a couple of events, and you know, now everything's kind of been on social media. Um, he, he, and a few others have done most of the actual like legislative work going to petitioning yeah. Congress. Um, okay. So then that's the, the other thing I wanted to touch on as it relates to your wife. It was something you wrote fairly recently um, because the president gets a ton of heat. You know, yeah. and, and lately it was all about, oh, you know, we're back on the whole myth of apparently the president hates his, you know, the soldiers and all that stuff. Um, right. You wrote something about when he 
met you when you were waiting for the return of your wife, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, how, how was that? Well, I mean, Dover is a pretty somber place as anybody from there knows. Um, so I was waiting for plane to arrive that had my wife, um, uh, John Farmer, Scott Wirtz, and Peter Todd's bodies. Um, and one someone from the president staff came by and said, Hey, president's going to be here. Um, and he, he, he wants to make the offer if any of the families want to meet with him privately, they can. Um, so I said, yeah, I'd love to. Um, just cause you know, why not? He's there. Why not? Why not get a chance to, to meet the president? And also I had just, uh, I had just come back from an appointment myself. I'd been out of the military for a little bit, but I transitioned over into something in the government that was still pretty much doing the same job I was doing before. Yeah. Um, so I had some opinions on the way things were going. Um, right. especially recently. Cause I mean, just to rewind for everybody, sure. Trump had tried to get us out of Syria earlier. Um, and that's when Mattis resigned, Brett McGurk resigned. Um, there was a, a big pushback from the DOD. I thought, and I still think that that was the right call. Um, I, I think you, you kind of hit diminishing returns. Once you strike these terrorists, I think you should get out and not get bogged down. That's the way Trump was thinking. Um, so I, I wanted to tell him that. Um, uh, so I, I actually got the opportunity. They had me in this little little room all by myself and I figured, Hey, the secret service is going to come and like pat me down. And then like someone else is going to come in and like, you know, I mean, I, I've had, I've had to jump through hoops to go meet a Colonel before, you know, yeah. like, or, <laughs> they always have people that come in and prep you. So I was like, but well, the president's probably going to be like 10 different people. Yeah. Now I'm at, standing there in the room. And then next thing you know, Trump just comes walking in, you know, at a, at a pretty fast paced clip and, you know, shakes my hand and says, he's, you know, very sorry for, the loss and sounds like Shannon was an amazing woman. And we spoke for, we spoke for quite a bit. It, it seemed like before, like a nervous looking, what I'm assuming is a secret service guy, like ducked in the room, looked around real quick and then kind of like went out. So I got the impression that Trump like somehow shook his PSD, but I, I don't know if that's what actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, right, that's, right. <laughs> that's the way it looked. And then after that, Secretary Pompeo came in and, and Secretary Esper, they're all there. Uh, but uh, the president and I got to speak for probably, man, it, it felt like probably about 20 minutes. You know, most of it was very heartfelt. He was, I could tell he was like deeply conflicted about losing soldiers. You know, he, he was, um, you know, grieved with me losing Shannon. You know, he was pretty torn up. She was in love. He was torn up that John Farmer had kids. Um, he, you know, it, to, to me, I think people who aren't used to dealing with um, the subject of death a lot and, and the subject of killed in action like we are, I, I think they, when they, when they, when they envision it in their head, they think it's going to be this big, massive, everybody's crying, everyone's grieving thing. Um, when really there, there's some, there's definitely some of that in, in private moments, yeah. but when there's a bunch of military people having to grieve their fallen and there's a leader that still has to lead all those folks, it's a different dynamic. And, and that's what I saw with Trump. Uh, the same thing I've, I saw with leaders on the battlefield, um, that he was conflicted. He was very sorry that she was, you know, she had been lost or she was killed. Um, but he knew that we, we had a mission to get on with. Um, and then after that, he asked me, you know, what, what I thought of things. I told him what my background was. He had read up on what my background was. He asked me yeah. what I think of the way things are going. So we got to talk on that for, for a little while longer too. That's not bad. Right. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I thought he was just going to like shake my hand and give me a coin or something, you know, yeah. but, did you get the coin? Eventually. Like, it <laughs> I think one of his aides, one of his aides gave him to me. Like Trump's like way more, I, he, he doesn't do a lot of the pomp and circumstance stuff. Like he, he doesn't hand out like hundred dollar bills and shit. No, man. I mean like the way he kind of talks on, on TV, like when he's being personable, that's, those have been my interactions with him. He's, yeah. you know, he's, he's definitely kind of a funny guy. Um, but also like in, in the moment he was very, you know, he's he was very somber and very yeah. respectful. And like I said, man, I, I could tell that it was weighing heavily on him. You know, he said he absolutely hated sending anyone off to their death. Mm. And that, that, I mean, that meant a lot to me. So why do you, like, I mean, and if it's not something you want to delve into, but why do you think, because I don't feel like he's the first, I think you touched aptly on President Obama and his reluctance based on the fact that it wasn't his. Right. So, right. Um, but with, with president Trump, part of what he originally campaigned on was ending or, well, no more stupid wars. 
or we, right. we don't remember that. Uh, but I know he wanted to end the stuff that's still going on in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I think it's, it's, you, you mentioned how the resignations from, you know, the secretary of defense at the time, general Mattis, uh, a few others that followed after why, did, why do you think like, it's so hard to just bring us the fuck home, man. Man, I, I think um, the biggest factor to me, I, and people always say, you know, military industrial complex and yeah. there's money to be made. And I think that does play a factor. However, the biggest thing to me, I think, is just human nature. I mean, all of us want to stay and fight until the job's done. Um, and, and, the, and the U.S. military, especially the all-volunteer all force, that's like, that you sign up every day. The guys that, when 9-11 happened, they said, hey, I'm joining. Or they said, hey, I'm staying yeah. in. Send me one. It's like, we'll keep going. We will because we love this country and we'll keep fighting. Um, so that's, that, that's, and then you, that becomes your life. And so you don't want to say that you lost, you don't want to have to come home until a job's done, even if the job really can't be defined. And I think with the senior leaders who've made their careers out of like, I have a somewhat new strategy and this time we're going to try this. Um, and it doesn't work. They just keep doubling down and they, they want to stay, you know, even longer. I, I think it's the big thing. What, but that partially spawns from we haven't had a ton of uh, leadership from the civilian side, where we're supposed to get it from, um, until President Trump came along. Uh, under Bush and under Obama, with, with different, for different justifications, both of them basically just said, the military is going to run the war, and I'm going to generally support the war. But that was kind of what they, those were the, that was the guidance they gave. Bush, it was like, start these new democracies somewhere. Yeah. And then Obama was like, I don't like Iraq, I think that's dumb. Afghanistan is a good war. Maybe we'll surge there and I'll announce a timeline to make myself look good, but then I won't follow through on it because I know the American people really aren't paying attention. So Trump did, in, in my view, Trump did not only the right thing, but he did the hard thing. If Trump wanted to blow off the GWAT and he wanted to blow off these wars, he easily could have because there's so few of us that serve that I think foreign policy is a very overlooked issue. Um, he, if he, if he didn't want to make any controversy, he wouldn't have had to touch it. He, he could have just been like, yeah, those dumb wars the other president started, like, that's not my deal. But he came in and he was like, okay, the buck stops with me. I'm going to do some different stuff. Um, and I think we've screwed up by getting buried in these places and staying deeply entrenched. We're going to hit hard. We're going to set an achievable goal, like defeat the territorial caliphate. We're not going to stay until schools are built and little girls are voting. Because what the hell is that? Like, we're, that's yeah. just not going to never work. That we're going to, defeat the caliphate and we're going to get the hell out. Um, and I think when someone comes in and says you're wrong, like Trump does, um, and then has some success, I think that offends a lot of people. I think it's just human nature. I, I think there's a lot of folks that are like, Hey, this is my life. I've been a professional uh, military officer my entire <laughs> career. Yeah. Was, most of our senior brass right now was probably at like the 05 level when the war kicked off. Yeah. So yeah. the leadership decisions have all been very much on their shoulders for the entire GWAT. And so for this outsider to come in and say, you guys are pretty messed up. I think it takes a pretty big, uh, emotionally mature leader to be like, all right, you know what? I really haven't had any success in this. Let's give me, give me your suggestions. But human nature is what it is. I think we remain deeply entrenched largely because of, um, a lot of ego. Uh, and it just reminds me of like you were, when you were saying that, did you ever see that, that, uh, Netflix movie with Brad Pitt, War Machine, right? Where it's I like, did, and, and, I, and I read the book too that was based off of it. It's, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of outlandish shit in there, but there's also a lot of accuracy in there. Yes, it's 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 like you said, like you know, I feel like that's. Here's what I would love to go back because I'm 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 not, I'm not going to pretend I'm I know I'm ignorant to it, right? What 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 do I think is that we have currently that is so common to our generation of these. Uh, deployments and all is a guy like yourself 11 deployments right big army um when we went into iraq we had open-ended orders i was in a reserve unit we got mobilized to support it our orders were indefinite like just from the start in 2003 and then i remember being told yeah you'll be home before christmas in 2003 and then when they caught saddam i told like you like brought that up it's like when they caught saddam i was like oh they pulled us all together. They announced they killed and captured or captured Saddam. I was like, oh, we are definitely going to be home. Over, right? <laughs> yeah, let's go. Um, that didn't happen. And then we were extended three more times after that because, you know, kind of like 
I mean, we've talked on it. I touched on this with Braxton. And it's just the way things unfolded with our civilian counterparts at the time we were in charge. We got into this deployment rotation mindset. Yep. You know, my, my first one into Iraq for 2003, 2004 was 16 months. Well, they realized, well, we can't do that again. And then, you know, the, the guys that replaced us, you know, 101st Airborne, the 1st Armored Division who kind of came in mid-tour, those guys were supposed to do a year. And then if you remember, probably over when you were there in 2006, like those guys, I think some of them did, it was what, 15 or 18 months? Or, it was something ridiculous. With the train up time, it may have been 18 months, but I feel like they were doing 12 to 15 month tours. Like it was ridiculous. And then that's slowly been chipped away to now it's going to be nine months, right? On ground, boots on ground, nine months. But the problem with that, if I go all the way back to World War II, for example, and I don't know if this is a correlation or not, is let's get back to war machine, right? What's, what's the premise of it? He shows up, I'm going to do everything different from what my predecessor did. His yep. time ends, here comes the next guy. I'm going to do everything yep. different from what this guy. So we never yep. really get real continuity. Right. Um, and then there's always someone trying to do something different in their time and that there's no, and I don't know this. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not trying to say I got any insight on any of this. I'm just saying it seems like from the big picture, if we focus outward and we look down, the guys in World War II, they were there. They were there until they won. No yeah. one got to come home. You know, my grandfather's yeah. brother who was in World War II, guy was there for almost three years. Yeah. He was in Korea for over a year and a half. I mean, like, yeah. they went and they were there, and then you came back when you won. And, like, I don't know, man. I don't know if, uh, if, if that's the mindset or if it's what you said. Like, there's that whole, you know, the CD military industrial complex that everyone talks about. Um, but do you yeah. think that plays a part I mean, in it? Yeah. I mean, there's a built-in incentive system in the government, but especially in the military, if you start something to build it to continue to go on forever. Like, government programs really shut down, and war right. is just that on a macro yeah. level. So, yeah, so if you, tell, if you tell, like, hey, Army and Marines and Navy, like, I need you guys to go fight a war here, but you don't say what the end is, like, they're just going to keep doing it because that's their job. They're soldiers, man. I mean, yeah. even the most ranking four-star general. So sometimes, as much as I like to bash on the, on the generals, when they freak out because Trump tries to get us out of a war, I, at the end of the day, they are just soldiers. Like we, we forget that we, mm -hmm. there's this been this huge media complex going back to probably World War II, but in our generation, starting with Petraeus, when everyone's yeah. like, Oh my God, PhD. And he's a, he's a soldier. Like this dude must be a genius. And the same thing with Mattis. Well, like Schwarzkopf was these guys are, with Gulf War. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Same thing. These guys are meant to be task doers by executive leadership elected by the people. So, when you don't provide that executive leadership, they'll just continue to go do what they're doing. And then from there, everything else will just spin off into its own self licking ice cream cone of like more deployments. You get promoted based off deployments. If you're on the, if you're on the civilian side, you get promoted based off of procuring more funds and spending those funds. It's the government, man. It's just, I mean, the post office runs that way, you know? So I, I mean, I think that's, that's unfortunately behind, that's the conspiracy really uh, in my eyes. The difference I think what you touched on with World War II, our leaders at that time and the American people agreed, the, the goal was we have to beat the Nazis and we have to beat the Japanese. And that was a, a hard goal that we had to hit. When we got into uh, the war on terror, initially it was like, hey, we're gonna go get Bin Laden and those assholes who flew the planes into the towers and the Taliban because they provided them sanctuary and we gave them yeah. But then within a couple months, when the Taliban and Al Qaeda, the key Taliban, Mullah Omar and those clowns, escaped into Pakistan, we just said, okay, time out. We're changing the whole game. Now it's nation building. Bush even said this, like, now it's our chance to remake the entire region. Okay, well, what does that mean? And anybody who asked those questions, they kind of got fired. So real quick, by the time it was like we are gearing up for Iraq and that crazy intel had been switched and morphed and bended into a link between Saddam and Al Qaeda and WMDs. It was, it was war machine. It was like, Hey man, like we're going to go and we're going to go do these things and we're just going to keep them going forever. Um, so I think, I think a lack of a clear purpose and continued civilian oversight is a recipe for like endless war. And, and you bring that, that perfect thing up, right? So let me, let me look, let me get this date. 
because I know the date. I'm trying to remember the year. Yeah. Okay, I was off by a year. So <laughs> we killed Bin Laden in May of 2011. So <laughs> where we found him packing, I could have thunk. <laughs> 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 what? <laughs> so so what what were you doing when you found that out? Or or did, did you have any involvement or anything that you are able to share or what, what was, what was going on in Joe Kent's world at 2011? Oh no, we were getting ready to go to Iraq, man. I was, I was heading over for my seventh trip to Iraq. Um, it, it would be the trip that we left. We, we pulled out of Iraq in, in 2011. A lot of frequent uh, flyer miles at that point, right? A lot of frequent flyer miles. So we just got enough of work up and we were doing the whole, I think we just come back off leave or something like that. Cause we were in Iraq shortly mm-hmm. thereafter. Um, so, I mean, I was pretty pumped that we killed him. I mean, I was a pretty big, uh cynic of or i guess critic of obama um but i was like man he pulled the trigger and he authorized those he authorized like seal team six to fly in on some 160th birds and shoot that dude in the face that's pretty awesome like i was like that's because I, I didn't i was like i would not have expected obama to authorize that like you know at the time so i mean as much as i'll say bad things about the Obama administration. I, I, I think he deserves a lot of credit for that, for authorizing the mission. I agree. I remember, I, I still remember I was, I don't know what the hell I was doing. Something had me awake. And I just remember I, I had the TV on and I was walking by and it was like, I see the president coming out and he's walking up to the podium. I'm like, what, what the fuck is he walking up this late for? Like, what yeah. do you have to hear? Like, and then when he said that, I was just like, you know, that meme where the dude's like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Shit. Like, oh shit! Did we really? And once again, you know what? I immediately flashed back to the the uh, the Saddam Hussein captured moment when I was in Iraq when they brought us together yeah. for that. I'm like, we're coming home, right? Or not? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we get we but we get this war plan, man. We get these. Yeah. Soft, you see these things? Like a Wi-Fi salsa night. <laughs> <laughs> salsa night. <laughs> I ain't gonna yeah, lie, I mean, like when I went to yeah. Afghanistan in 2013, man, I, I loved that. I was in yeah. Kabul. And uh, hey, salsa, like there were some good nights in the BFAC in, in Kabul. Bagram had some good nights too, but you know. MWR doesn't play around, man. I no, not in Kabul. We were, we were lucky. We were, we were under a, a three star command at the time, so they had all the money for food. So we were not hurting. But I feel <laughs> bad for all the people who were out on those fobs and cops, but what, you know. Luck of the draw. We all choose our own MOS, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> I got a buddy. He's uh, he, one of my one of my guys. Is he was in he was at Cobb Keating, and I always fuck with him because he was talking about how bad the food was. And I was like, hey man, no one told you to become a Cav Scout. <laughs> At least you're in a movie and a book. <laughs> it's a trade offs, man. It's a trade offs. Uh, okay, so that happened. You 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 were on your way to Iraq. Um, was there any? T- okay, and then you met your wife shortly thereafter in 2013. So what was her? kind of what was her story i don't think i've seen anything that i've looked at like what was her story why did she join the navy or what was her motivation yeah so she's a new yorker man so 9-11 was her motivation oh, shit. okay yeah. i mean she had um she had looked at the military i think before when she was in high school um yeah. and then, you know again pre-9-11 it was like okay well no not really for me um she had a knack for languages and she she knew it she uh self-taught spanish self-taught french oh, wow. Um, so she wanted to do something international. She was looking at the State Department. She was in college um, when 9-11 happened, but her father recently just retired from the New York State Troopers, uh, oh, wow. and then her uncle's a uh, Staten Island firefighter. Nice. Um, so they were 9-11 first responders. They yeah. spent, I think, about a week down, in nine, uh, down at Ground Zero. Um, both lost friends who, who ran into the rubble. Um, so Shannon and her younger brother both uh, headed down to the recruiter station um, and enlisted Shannon went uh, went with the Navy because they um, offered her DLI uh, yeah. the language school. So yeah. she went into the recruiters and was like, "Look, I know I can learn Arabic. Sign me up for whatever job that is, you know." And then I guess Army and the Marines were like, uh, "We'll get back to you." Or, "Hey, have you ever thought about being a whatever?" But the Navy was like, "Yeah, we'll send it. If you can pass the test, we'll send you the DLI." So they gave her a DLab and she smoked it. Um, and so she ended up uh, doing the whole DLI rap. So it was. Kind of similar to me being in the Q course, it, it, it took her until she, she joined in 03. It took her until uh, 06 to get to a unit. So she got to Fort Gordon, Georgia, which is where linguists are supposed to do their first pump, where they, they sit with headphones on and translate stuff. But at the time, the surge was kicking off. Uh, uh, they, they asked for volunteers, and she had volunteered. Um, and so she ended up 
Yeah, of course she yeah. did. She ended up loving the draw. Um, you know, she they were, they were like, hey, if you want to take a PT test and go do a weapons call, maybe you can go to CJ Soda, which is the Combined Joint Special Operations yeah. Task Force. She said she didn't even know what that was, but she was like, well, if they want us to be in shape and shoot, it's got to be kind of cool, right? So she went and took it. <laughs> and then she, she showed up to, uh, to Balad as an analyst um, and then sort of just worked her way down to Baghdad. Um, she ended up supporting the, uh, the SEALs and the Rangers there doing the task force mission. Um, the, one of the, the strike force commanders from the SEAL teams that she worked with was like, hey, we have slots for your MOS. Um, it's a new thing where you can be assigned to the SEAL teams. You got to go through a selection process. Are you interested? And she was like, absolutely. I'm totally interested. Uh, so she went back from that deployment, went to the selection process to go be a, uh, a direct support uh, person for the SEAL teams. Um, and then she deployed again to, to Iraq. She was supposed to deploy as a SIGINT linguist, but this is a time when the SEALs really hadn't gotten in on the whole engaging with the local population thing. They were still very kinetic, um, but that requirement was kind of emerging. And Shannon, again, put her hand up and was like, hey, I will go talk to Iraqis all day long. Like, yeah. I, can, I know this language really well. And then SEALs were like, yeah, let's see what she, let's, let's see what she got. And so she started uh, doing the human thing. And kind of made a niche for herself there. So she deployed a couple more times to Iraq and then uh, once more to Afghanistan uh, before we met. So h- how, did, how did that go for her, though? You're talking about she was, you know, she volunteered to go out and talk to the Iraqis. And all. How, did, how did, I guess, I would assume you talked to her someone on this, but how did they respond to, you know, this, you know, fair-skinned white woman from America who speaks yeah. their language, like, coming in trying to have a conversation with them? Because, again, like, just knowing the the uh, the Iraqi culture, that's not exactly. Hey, you know, women just going up and starting right. conversations, right? And then on top of that, she's an American. I mean, yeah. How- I think most of them. She um, she was re- her Arabic was really good, and not okay. just really good. She could imitate the accent really, really well. Oh wow! Okay. So I've seen Arabs react to her, um, especially if it's in person. She's blue, you know, fair skin, ginger, yeah. red eye, yeah. or, uh, yeah. blue eyes, um, and. And so they're usually just kind of like in awe because she does the, she does the, the Iraqi dialect pretty well. Okay. Um, so I think she had a lot of like fascination. Um, and then from there, I, I think finding good, good linguists was just few and far between. So I, I, I think at a time when women were not really around special operations very much, I think like her skill set was so in demand that they were like, all right, whatever, man, it works. And the Iraqis, I think, were mostly just interested that someone – some American had taken the time to learn their language and like learn it really, really well. Point. Yeah, that's a good point. So I, I think this is one of those things where like, you know, I tell people this all the time, like we don't have the time for like a lot of bullshit in the military. So when people talk about like, oh, discrimination, this and that, I'm like, yeah, maybe some of it's there. I'm like, but if you're in, if you're in war, war, like where like the pressure's really on, like all that matters is can someone Can you do perform. your job? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and so because this, the times were what they were, 07, you know, 08 in Iraq, and then later on, she started the Afghan surge. Like, it was all about performance. Yeah, and I, like, I joked, I was showing uh, my girl your your bio and then hers, and she was reading on some of the stuff, and then she's like, she sounds like the real version of uh, Carrie from Homeland. I'm like... Yeah, kind of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, the stuff you see Carrie do, like, like she was doing that shit for real. Like... <laughs> <laughs> like that's what's cr- like that's i just think that's a it's a it's a it's an amazing story man like i like i said i remember reading and, and hearing about it last year when it happened and i was just I, I never thought that i'd sit here you know and be talking to her husband but um just a great legacy man i think like she's it, it's not even started yet like it's so fresh still you know yeah. the, the stuff that's going to come 10 15 years down the line because of her like her impact uh, and even yours, man, let's not, like I said, I'd, we're not trying, I'm not trying to shortchange you at all. That's why I wanted to focus on your initial career. Like, man, uh, there's not a lot of men like you out there, man. There's definitely not a lot of women like your, your wife. So I think, it's, I think it's, 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 it's amazing what you've, uh, you, you guys have done. And um, I hope it's not like, you know, Michael Jordan and his kids, you know, they wanted to play basketball too, but they weren't Michael Jordan. You know, you got, you, got, <laughs> you, you guys have set the bar pretty high for your boys, man. Hopefully they'll uh, get a good chance to do some good things themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think they'll be all right, man. They, they got enough for mom and, and like, like, you know, I just told them tenacity, man. That's the, that's the secret. Yeah. Ingredient. Hard work. So has, you, has your son started school? Was he first grade kindergarten? Kindergarten. So he, he turned five in August. 
waste. So okay. We kind of got changed because of COVID last year. So we got to yeah. do preschool this year. How's that working for uh, dad life? You doing the distance learning thing for him online or what? Uh, so I was, I was dreading that, man, because I could find <laughs> home on a computer, man. Come on. So I, I luckily found a private school here. That's oh, cool. Here. So I got them wearing little masks and it's only three days a week, but it's, it's, it's better than trying to make yeah. my kid look at a computer. Yeah. yeah. My daughter, she started high school this year and uh, it's all virtual at the moment, but hopefully moving into uh, some in, some in-person stuff next month if all maintains, but. I can't imagine being a high schooler if they'd have been like, Hey, just log on your computer. I'd been like, yeah, okay. Right, for that. Like, right on it, man. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, totally, man. Yeah. Well, I was telling Javier, like I did half of my master's through like online and, and in-person and on all the online stuff, I was just like. Yeah. I used to- <laughs> yeah, I mean the the effort was totally maximal. Uh, no, I need I, yeah. I'm the type of person that needs to be in person because I I like the interaction and everything. Yeah, so I, no, I do. I understand. I feel that for your son, man. Like, hopefully that's that's working for him because that's a lot. Uh, starting school, but just it's gotta be it's gotta be a pretty. Uh, I don't know if it's confusing or just a, a weird time for even them, right? Like, do they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like the whole. Locked down, they couldn't go see their little friends anymore, and like, yeah, it's weird, you know. And then they ask questions, and you're like, dude, I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, I can't take them in the store anymore. Like, I, you know, yeah. five for some reason is the cutoff when they make them put masks on. So I'm like, oh, is it really? Oh, uh, yeah. Damn. Um, she's taken pretty well, which I was surprised about, but I'm like, this has got to be so weird for a five year old. Like, they put yeah. on that. well, that's what I was thinking, like, for her, because I remember, I remember very clearly my first day of ninth grade because I was late by two hours you know thanks mom um <laughs> so yeah no I could just imagine I even felt bad for these kids last year and they all had to drop out and or not drop yeah. out but like they didn't get to graduate high school like you know the gym I go to his son was a baseball player at one of the high schools he didn't get to have their senior seat like it's just a weird time for the kids man that's I'm not worried about myself or I'm definitely not worried about you, Joe. Sorry, but uh, I'm just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're fine. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I just feel like it's, it's a rough time for these, these teenagers and, and kids, yeah. man. Um, so let me ask you about that. Cause I have a nice hypothesis as Nick searched for the scientific method on our little thing last week. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hypothesize that, uh, one way or the other, I think one way or the other now, because Nick kind of woke me up to it because I feel like a lot of this is contention towards the, the coming election. But I, I originally hypothesized that if like if 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 Biden were to win, everything's going to go magically back to normal just in time for the Thanksgiving travel season. Uh, but now I also feel like even if uh, President Trump wins, like Ron and Nick pointed out last week, like they have, he has nothing to worry about anymore. He's not running for reelection. Like things are going to yeah. one way or the other kind of return to normal fairly quickly. Do you think, do you think that, or how, how do you know? I, I 100% agree, man. I, if, if Biden wins, um, I think he'll, the difference is Biden will blow a bunch of smoke. He'll say it because of science, they won't explain yeah. the science, but they'll be like, because we believe in science, science says, that we can now go back about our lives and Biden is a hero and whatever kind of remedies come up with, they'll, they'll credit Biden for. So I think he'll just say science a whole bunch and we'll be boom back to normal. I, I think Trump will be honest. I think he'll say, look, we're working on vaccines. We're working on some things that could help ease this. If you're an at risk population, you should probably continue to take measures. Um, if you need to apply for benefits, apply for benefits, but the rest of us, we're going to get back on with our lives. I think that's what Trump's going to say. Which is actually like the honest answer because nobody really knows, but we kind of see enough now. Like this isn't killing hundreds of thousands of millions of people, you know, in America anyways. Yeah. Well, and then that was the other thing though, because he's, here's the only thing I was confused about when well, I'm not confused about, I'm concerned about is um, the president can say that. However, the governors, you know, they all, right. like, there, there's, there's a few of them that like to be, you know, the, the yeah. center of attention because they have maybe some, some bigger ambitions. And I'll be honest, like very early on, I, I, I was a big proponent of Governor Newsom here in California. I thought he did the right thing very early on with the uncertainty because it, it's, it's too hard to know in that moment one way or the other. Like yeah. you can't, I don't, I'm not a big armchair quarterback guy. I don't, I'm not, I don't have all that information. I'm not making that decision. Yeah. I just want to trust that our leadership's going to do the right thing. But how it's kind of progressed, it's like, I feel like, 
the governors are gonna they're gonna they're gonna grandstand. They're not gonna if Trump comes out and says that even after they win. Well, you know, we still afford a lot of autonomy to states to make up their own minds. Yes. You know, you can't really force anything. Right? I mean, especially out here, the West Coast governors yeah. are all gonna, the West Coast governors are all gonna like clutch their pearls and be like, I can't believe Trump yeah. wants to kill all of us. Yeah. And but they're gonna do that, like to, like you said, the grandstand. But then they're they only I mean they have the authority to do that, but they only have like for them to continue giving people unemployment benefits and not get any relief from the federal government. I think that'll kind of sort itself out, you know, because Trump's going to be like, "No, I told you to get back to work. You're not getting any more federal money. Sorry." Yeah, that, and and now that you bring that up, I was just you, you mentioned the West. I was like, I just remembered, like, there's that whole Western Governors Association, right? Like, or, yeah, right? crazy, yeah, Washington, yeah. Oregon, California, yeah. So I haven't heard much of that recently. I was just curious. <laughs> Yeah, there's some real leaders on there. Yeah. My thing with like, man, I don't want to, I don't, I don't like the nitpick because I know people, everybody speaks differently. And I think Governor Newsom is very, he's, he's, he reminds me almost, he, he's like Obama, but he's got a lot of like hand gestures and shit. He's always like, we're in the middle of climate yeah. change. <laughs> yeah. You can't deny, like he does a lot of hand, he speaks a lot with his hands. He would not do well in the army where you're not allowed to speak with your hands. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he was up here you know visiting the fires and it's like man i don't know if this is the moment you want to use as your you know definitive answer for this is climate change like there's a lot of other right. shit we could be doing like i don't know are so the, the wildfires in oregon is there a lot of like mismanagement of the forest up there at all because you got i think you guys have a hell of a lot more fucking trees than we do at this point <laughs> yeah yeah we do so a lot of dead I mean, trees. That's the thing. That's, yeah, it's it's been a big forest management issue, and then the logging industry's been dead for so long. So there really hasn't been a lot of like places where they go in, they selectively deforest, and they clear the underbrush. Like that, that's been controversial for a while, and because of the left wing politics, it just yeah. hasn't been happening. So now they're screaming climate change, but it's like, well, these these wildfires are pretty well documented, going back to like when it was just the Native Americans out here. You know, like, this yeah. stuff. Happened out here it's not all climate change and then there's you know the occasional antifa guy out there setting up throwing molotov cocktails and screaming climate change so <laughs> and they let him out of jail and he lights another fire because it's <laughs> that's just what we do here just to be very on brand so i mean i don't have a ton of confidence of anything coming from the the west coast governors um but i, I think the the federal pressure um and the lack of funds would they would find a, a politically nice way of, they'd find a politically safe way of saying, we're going to reopen again, you know, and then, then they'll be able to blame Trump too if something goes wrong. So I think they'll probably, <laughs> like, well, we grandstand told us to open. Yeah. yeah. Trump, Trump, uh, Trump, no, Trump. I, I, I did just notice uh, San Francisco is going to be opening salons. <laughs> <laughs> salons and gyms you know you gotta wear your mask but i wonder what what just happened in a in a, in a san francisco salon not that far that's ago. so awesome good for her for, for <laughs> that, that lady right there is like mvp of 2020 it's just oh my goodness like between between her and biden and it's just like it, it, it cracks me up that we were able, like Congress at, at one point with President Truman was like, you know what, fuck this. We're, we're putting term limits on the presidency, but they've never right. managed to do it to themselves. And that's what cracks me up. Yeah, it's beautiful, <laughs> beautiful right? Like, you know, not Truman, it was Roosevelt. I'm sorry. But yeah, but yeah like. Uh, yeah, it's not good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, just, they have, they, they, I mean, they all talk about it, but then like for some reason that one just never really gets to the floor for a vote. Yeah. Not not a big lobby on the all uh, 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 term limit thing. Um, all right, Joe, uh, give me a give me a, can you give me a prediction for November or? Oh man, so I don't have a a bright and rosy one, man. I I think um, it would have been way more contested prior to all the unrest. Um, I think Trump's going to win because of the unrest. I mean, yeah, I, I, think I think Trump has a solid record. I think he deserved to win. Um, based off of what he's done, but that's a different story. Uh, you know, with, with all the unrest and the way that the left and the Democrats all kind of went all in on ignoring that or encouraging that, I think that really bit them in the ass. And, and I think it's really exposed the fact they don't have a platform to run on and they don't have any new ideas. And so I think a lot of people are very frustrated with that. And 
for some reason, they've for for some reason in crazy twenty twenty, Trump is the most rational guy. Yeah. And that's that's a self inflicted wound of the Democrats. I think Trump's very rational in his policy execution, but he doesn't come across as a rational guy. So what he says, right? right. So really, I mean, in the Democrats again, they land themselves to blame. So I do think Trump's going to win, but like we talked about before, I think it's going to be contested. Um, I don't think it's really going to be contested. I think Trump's legitimately going to win the electoral college and possibly even the popular vote. But I think the left right now has done such a good job between the four years of Russian collusion bullshit. Um, and then just general like election interference and then mail-in voting with the COVID excuse. And then all the way up until like all this crap about how Trump won't accept the, the results. The, the Democrats have basically already said that it's going to be rigged. It's going to look like Trump's going to win the whole red mirage thing that came out, the war games we spoke of earlier. Yeah. Uh, so I think that they're a, a good section of the left is going to scream foul and there is going to be a fight. And I, and I think it might even have to go to the Supreme court. Um, Cause I think Trump, Trump knows they're going to do that. And so Trump's going to be like, no man, I'm not going to step down based on what you guys say. And I think Biden's going to be heavily pressured to not when that, that two was a two seventy. whenever the electoral college thing comes out, Biden's going to be pressured by his side to not do that. And so I think we're going to be looking at a case where there's going to be a good deal of unrest, especially like in DC um, coming up in November. So I think Trump win and then further unrest, unfortunately. Why do you think, because I, I, I talked about this a few weeks ago, but why do you think like the Democrats have just completely abandoned law and order patriotism like it, it doesn't seem like they even point to those as planks of their platform anymore they've just they've just they've given it up to the republican party who you know good for them they capitalize if you're if you're a politician you're going to capitalize on what your opponent gives you and they 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 bring it out there and they, they highlight it at every opportunity they can but the democrats have just they don't even make the effort now yeah. they say they support these things, and of course, why would they say they don't? But when it's time to highlight it or really showcase it, like it, there's a very vast dichotomy between watch Trump's State of the Union and then watch the previous administration's State of the Union. Like we're seeing things that are vastly different, and we already have talked about we're we're a nation that doesn't really like nuance at this point but if all you're telling me is uh one side is all about what you said like hey you know we're law and order and the other one is just like nah we need to just change everything well you know i, I don't think the average american wants to change everything and is against law enforcement no matter what the shortcomings are of certain institutions like why do you think they've just here republicans you guys have it i I mean, honestly, I think the big answer goes, goes back to the way that the far radical left with some Marxist ideology and all that's taken over or took over 20, 30, even, even, even further back, the, uh, the academic um, yeah. part of our, took over the campuses. They've been trying to change the American you know, academic curriculum in, in middle school and high school. Um, so I think the left has partially bought off on that. Um, but another big problem I think that the left is having right now is those who thought they were a part of the Democrat, the more labor minded um, type of blue dog Democrats. Yeah, they're gone. Those, those guys are getting pushed out, um, but they're still there and they're still holding some power. And so I think you see a very conflicted party right now. And that's why I think they embraced a lot of the chaos because they thought it was going to make Trump look bad. And a lot of the chaos is just is rage at the Democrat party for not being able to put forth a coherent, they had they put forth a coherent candidate for one <laughs> or agenda. Like, what, what did the Democrats stand for at this point? Like, yeah. you, I don't know. What do they stand for? Do I listen to AOC yapping about fucking the Green New Deal or Nancy Pelosi who just says Trump's evil? Like, right now, the whole Democrat platform is Trump's bad, yeah. you know, and that, that's not a platform. So I think they've latched on to this rage event, this violence, and they think they can control it. They're suckers for thinking they can control it. But I think mostly it's just internal rage. Like they, mm -hmm. rightfully so, their constituents are furious because if you believe in Democrat, whatever, whatever you think the Democrat ideals are, you have to be furious because the best they could come up with was Joe Biden, who's been at this for freaking 50 years, and then Kamala Harris, who she got crushed in the initial run of the Democrat primary. She wasn't even like the second or third or fourth or fifth. 
she was out early. It was Biden. That's what's even up. And was Biden. So, I mean, so what are they doing? And so that's, that's why I think you see so much, okay, we, the blue dog Democrats, whatever you want to call them, the, the rational Democrats, we can't coalesce behind anything. These young, passionate kids, they seem like they're onto something. Let's hope that if we hoodwink and nod at them enough, they'll give us the votes to put us in power. Yeah. Whereas I don't think the kids that are out throwing Molotov cocktails are like, you know what I want to do? I want to get Joe Biden in power. Like, <laughs> that's, that's not what those kids are thinking, you know? Yeah. Like, but Pelosi and Chuck Schumer are just like, oh, no, we'll be able to control this. Like, uh, you couldn't really control going to the salon, Nancy. I don't <laughs> think you're controlling freaking the insurgency. Yeah, and so that's why, like, okay, 2016, I kind of chalked it up to the, the Democrats having their yeah. – version of what the republicans did in 2008 where it's like oh it was hillary's yep. time just like yep. it was mccain's time it's like let's not yep. nominate the best candidate let's just do who's supposed to get their yep. chance and that's why i thought uh if there was any year to bring forth a a candidate outside the norm some someone that could inspire all those people you just talked about this was it like you've got a guy that is just in my opinion it never been more beatable as an incumbent than this year for whatever reason whether it was it, it's media yeah. driven or whatever just a lot of circumstances that kind of fell up against him and and with with the covid making its appearance like and then they choose to run right the the, the epitome of status quo like why yeah. would they purposely do this yeah who's on a major decline like no one denies the guy is not well, what yeah that's to. the other thing i mean like, jesus guys come on I mean, like, literally all the Democrats had to do was not be crazy. Yep. And they couldn't do it. And, like, Trump, a while back, Trump went with, I think, I, I don't know this, but I think Trump went with, I can say crazy shit with the guarantee that it will drive my opponents so nuts, they'll say something even crazier. And, like, nine times out of ten, it's worked out for him. Like, they, Trump will say something crazy, and they will light themselves on fire. Like, that, that's kind of, like, what's happened here. I mean... Uh, that's where I think the rage comes from. Like they didn't really do, I mean, in the military, after we do an operation, we do an after actions review, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't shout feel like the guy were, on the after yeah. action review. <laughs> right. Shout out to Nick. But I mean, did the DNC do an AAR after 2016? To me, it really, <laughs> really, really kind of looks like they might have finger drilled that AAR. Like, yeah. <laughs> It might have been a five-minute hot wash, and they were fucking good. Yeah. Hey, hey, give me three ups, three downs. Let's get out of here. Yeah. Let's go again, guys. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so now they're like, Oh, I thought we were going to impeach this dude. We have to do another election again. It's like, yeah, it's 2020. They're like, ah, oh, shit, Biden, I guess. You know, and <laughs> it's, it's 20. It's, that, that just snuck right up on us. I, I mean, I feel like it snuck up on me, to be honest, man. Like, I, I remember yeah. 2016 election night, clear as day, because yeah, I had just gotten out here. I'd been out here two weeks in California. I was in a fucking casino of all places, just watching the meltdown take place. And I loved yeah. it. I was drinking $4 beers and loving it. I was just like, whoa, let it, let it. Let those tears flow, baby. It's not over losing money tonight. <laughs> that was great. Um, okay, so the, so the last thing that came out today that I just get your opinion on real quick, uh, do you think Biden's going to accept a, a debate moderated by Joe Rogan? God, I hope so, man. <laughs> I, hope, so I, I hope he takes it because I, I do think that would be an awesome model to move to. Yeah. Like you get a guy. Joe Rogan, our guy like Joe Rogan, who has an independent podcast. I know he's moving to Spotify, but right now it's independent. Yeah. Uh, you cut out the mainstream media because fuck them. Like, we don't need them <laughs> in politics anymore. Like, nope, not anymore. Uh, and then they, they, they literally just sit down like you and I are for mm -hmm. four hours, and they actually have to articulate what their views are. I think that's great. Um, I, I, I really hope they do it. I don't think Biden's going to take him up on it, but I, I am looking forward to seeing what excuse they make. Are they going to go with the whole Nancy Pelosi? Like we can't dignify Trump with debating him because that's just going to look crazy. So I thought it was pretty epic when, when Trump responded to Tim Kennedy's tweet. I do. Like, <laughs> really quick, like I do. Cause you know, he, that just like made it, that probably added like 10 years on the Trump's life. Like, <laughs> that like reversed age. Room. That's the thing, man. Like, cause I just, I, I've talked about this, like, I I still remember clear as day, like the 2012 VP debate when it was Joe Biden versus Paul Ryan. And I thought Biden destroyed Paul Ryan. Like I remember watching that feeling bad for Paul Ryan because he just wasn't ready. He fought, he fought dirty. Yeah. Yeah. And Biden was just like, oh, watch this. And just he kept hammering him. And, and that guy's not there anymore, which I feel bad because like, look, man, we can 
at the end of the day, we're all Americans, but you know what? The man is just not who he was in 2012. And I don't expect him to be like, he's, he's not a young man. Like this shit happens to everyone. No one gets to cheat or outrun death or the decline that precedes it. And that's why I feel bad. And that's why I'm just like, okay, this is who you guys chose to run against. Literally the guy, the ultimate troll of a candidate who just can't wait to use every possible thing against you and has no qual or qualms about doing it. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, man, I, I, I know we talked about it, but I can't wait for the 29th, the first debate. And just if whoever we get on to just sit here and watch and react to this, I think it's going to be fucking hilarious in a good way. Yeah, I think it's going to be, how, whatever form they do, if they do any debate whatsoever, it's going to be epic. And yeah, I, I, I also feel bad for Biden. I think he's a guy who's like, hey man, he's kind of a weasel politician, but he's sort of served, he served his country. Yep. You know, he's had some loss. He's, he's had some loss that I can partially relate to, you know, in his life. So I feel, I, I feel for the guy. I do. I'll so I, I do feel like it's like borderline senior abuse, what they're doing to that guy, you know, driving him around and making him read off cards. It's like, dude, let's think. Let him go sit on his freaking deliver jack pizza yellow. and beer to a bunch of people he doesn't know. It's weird. Man, come on, yeah, just let, like a let glorified the guy fucking uh, Uber Eats driver, man. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joe, man, I appreciate you joining me. Uh, yeah. Is there anything you want to you want to drop plug or whatever on your way out the door? No, man, go buy uh, buy Braxton's book. Yeah, let's buy Braxton's book. I, if you haven't bought the Glass I, Factory, you should go buy that. Go on BraxtonMcCoy.com or it's on yeah. Amazon. We got some reviews up there, but buy Braxton's book. Um, yeah. yeah my plays, Joe? Where, where's, your, where's your book, Joe? So my book is coming out. Um, we don't know exactly when yet. We're going to have it done. I'm writing it right now with uh, Marty Scoblin Jr. from Black Rifle Coffee. Oh, um, sure. Yeah, man. So we actually got a pretty good uh, book deal with uh, Harper Collins. So that should be out, we're hoping, 2021. Um, a lot of it depends on the DOD's review. So DOD, if you're listening, like we're doing our best to write it, not classified. So Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, look. Hopefully we'll get hung up. If the guy who shot Bin Laden in the face can talk about it and tweet about it literally every day, I think, <laughs> like every day? Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think your book will be all right, man. <laughs> yeah, so we're. Uh, I'll let you know when that comes out, man. We'll yeah, hell yeah, man. I'd love to get you back on here and talk about it some more. I can't wait to read it, man. But thanks again for everything you did for uh, the country, but also uh, just coming out and hanging out, man, for a little bit. I appreciate you, brother. Yeah, dude, thanks for having me on, man. I'm glad. I'm glad you're doing a podcast. I'm glad Nick's still doing his. I think it's fucking awesome, man. Yeah. more veterans need to do these. We'll, we'll we'll get the goon media company going at some point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Have a good night, brother. All right, man. Take care.